Chapter Eleven. It is a plot of his weaving. I see it all now," said the infuriated mother. Pons sprang up as if the trump of doom were sounding in his ears. Yes," said the lady, her eyes like two springs of green bile. This gentleman wished to repay a harmless joke by an insult. Who will believe that the German was right in his mind? He is either an accomplice in a wicked scheme of revenge, or he is crazy. I hope, Monsieur Pons, that in future you will spare us the annoyance of seeing you in the house where you have tried to bring shame and dishonor. Pons stood like a statue with his eyes fixed on the pattern of the carpet. "'Well, are you still here, monster of ingratitude?' cried she, turning round on Pons, who was twirling his thumbs. "'Your master and I are never at home, remember, if this gentleman calls,' she continued, turning to the servants. "'Jean, go for the doctor, and bring Hartshorn, Madeleine.' In the Présidente's eyes, the reason given by Brunner was simply an excuse. There was something else behind. But at the same time, the fact that the marriage was broken off was only the more certain. A woman's mind works swiftly in great crises, and Madame de Marville had hit at once upon the one method of repairing the check. She chose to look upon it as a scheme of revenge. This notion of ascribing a fiendish scheme to Pons satisfied family honour. Faithful to her dislike of the cousin, she treated a feminine suspicion as a fact. Women, generally speaking, hold a creed peculiar to themselves, a code of their own. To them anything which serves their interests or their passions is true. The Présidente went a good deal further. In the course of the evening she talked the president into her belief, and next morning found the magistrate convinced of his cousin's culpability. Everyone, no doubt, will condemn the lady's horrible conduct, but what mother in Madame Camusot's position will not do the same? Put the choice between her own daughter and an alien, she will prefer to sacrifice the honour of the latter. There are many ways of doing this, but the end in view is the same. The old musician fled down the staircase in haste, but he went slowly along the boulevards to his theatre. He turned in mechanically at the door, and mechanically he took his place and conducted the orchestra. In the interval he gave such random answers to Schmucke's questions that his old friend dissembled his fear that Pons's mind had given way. To so childlike a nature, the recent scene took the proportions of a catastrophe. He had meant to make every one happy, and he had aroused a terrible slumbering feeling of hate. Everything had been turned topsy-turvy. He had at last seen mortal hate in the President's eyes, tones, and gesture. On the morrow, Madame Camusot de Marville made a great resolution. The president likewise sanctioned the step now forced upon them by circumstances. It was determined that the estate of Marville should be settled upon Cécile at the time of her marriage, as well as the house in the Rue de Hanovre and a hundred thousand francs. In the course of the morning the présidente went to call upon the Comtesse Papineau, for she saw plainly that nothing but a settled marriage could enable them to recover after such a check. To the Comtesse Papineau she told the shocking story of Pons's revenge, Pons's hideous hoax. It all seemed probable enough when it came out that the marriage had been broken off simply on the pretext that Cécile was an only daughter. The Présidente next dwelt artfully upon the advantage of adding de Marville to the name of Papineau and the immense dowry. At the present price fetched by land in Normandy, at two per cent, the property represented nine hundred thousand francs, and the house in the Rue de Hanovre about two hundred and fifty thousand. No reasonable family could refuse such an alliance. The Comte and Comtesse Papineau accepted, and as they were now touched by the honour of the family with which they were about to enter, they promised to help explain away yesterday evening's mishap. 
and now in the house of the elder camusot before the very persons who had heard madame de marville singing frederic brunner's praises but a few days ago that lady to whom nobody ventured to speak on the topic plunged courageously into explanations really nowadays she said one could not be too careful if a marriage was in question especially if one had to do with foreigners and why madame what has happened to you asked madame chiffreville do you not know about our adventure with that bruner who had the audacity to aspire to marry cecile his father was a german that kept a wine shop and his uncle is a dealer in rabbit skins is it possible so clear-sighted as you are murmured a lady these adventurers are so cunning but we found out everything through berthier his friend is a beggar that plays the flute he is friendly with a person who lets furnished lodgings in the rue de mailly and some tailor or other we found out that he had led a most disreputable life and no amount of fortune would be enough for a scamp that has run through his mother's property why mademoiselle de marville would have been wretched said madame berthier how did he come to your house asked old madame lebas it was monsieur pons out of revenge he introduced this fine gentleman to us to make us ridiculous this bruner it is the same name as fontaine in french this bruner that was made out to be such a grandee has poor enough health he is bald and his teeth are bad the first sight of him was enough for me i distrusted him from the first but how about the great fortune that you spoke of a young married woman asked shyly the fortune was not nearly so large as they said these tailors and the landlord and he all scraped the money together among them and put all their savings into this bank that they are starting what is a bank for those that begin in these days simply a license to ruin themselves a banker's wife may lie down at night a millionaire and wake up in the morning with nothing but her settlement at first word at the very sight of him we made up our minds about this gentleman he is not one of us you can tell by his gloves by his waistcoat that he is a working man the son of a man that kept a pothouse somewhere in germany he has not the instincts of a gentleman he drinks beer and he smokes smokes ah madame twenty-five pipes a day what would have become of poor lily it makes me shudder even now to think of it god has indeed preserved us and besides cecile never liked him who would have expected such a trick from a relative an old friend of the house that had dined with us twice a week for twenty years we have loaded him with benefits and he played his game so well that he said cecile was his heir before the keeper of the seals and the attorney-general and the home secretary that bruner and monsieur pons had their story ready and each of them said that the other was worth millions no i do assure you all of you would have been taken in by an artist's hoax like that in a few weeks time the united forces of the camusot and popinot families gained an easy victory in the world for nobody undertook to defend the unfortunate pons that parasite that curmudgeon that skinflint that smooth-faced humbug on whom everybody heaped scorn he was a viper cherished in the bosom of the family he had not his match for spite he was a dangerous mountebank whom nobody ought to mention about a month after the perfidious werther's withdrawal poor pons left his bed for the first time after an attack of nervous fever and walked along the sunny side of the street leaning on schmucke's arm nobody in the boulevard du temple laughed at the pair of nutcrackers for one of the old men looked so shattered and the other so touchingly careful of his invalid friend by the time that they reached the boulevard poissonniere a little color came back to pons's face he was breathing the air of the boulevards 
he felt the vitalizing power of the atmosphere of the crowded street the life-giving property of the air that is noticeable in quarters where human life abounds in the filthy roman ghetto for instance with its swarming jewish population where malaria is unknown perhaps to the sight of the streets the great spectacle of paris the daily pleasure of his life did the invalid good they walked on side by side though pons now and again left his friend to look at the shop windows opposite the theatre des varietes he saw count popinot and went up to him very respectfully for of all men pons esteemed and venerated the ex-minister the peer of france answered him severely i am at a loss to understand sir how you can have no more tact than to speak to a near connection of a family whom you tried to brand with shame and ridicule by a trick which no one but an artist could devise understand this sir that from to-day we must be complete strangers to each other madame la comtesse popinot like every one else feels indignant at your behaviour to the marvilles and count popinot passed on leaving pons thunderstruck passion justice policy and great social forces never take into account the condition of the human creature whom they strike down the statesman driven by family considerations to crush pons did not so much as see the physical weakness of his redoubtable enemy what is it mein boor friend exclaimed schmucke seeing how white pons had grown it is a fresh stab in the heart pons replied leaning heavily on schmucke's arm i think that no one save god in heaven can have any right to do good and that is why all those who meddle in his work are so cruelly punished the old artist's sarcasm was uttered with a supreme effort he was trying excellent creature to quiet the dismay visible in schmucke's face so i think schmucke replied simply pons could not understand it neither the camusots nor the popinots had sent him notice of cecile's wedding on the boulevard des italiens pons saw m cardot coming towards them warned by count popinot's allocution pons was very careful not to accost the old acquaintance with whom he had dined once a fortnight for the last year he lifted his hat but the other mayor and deputy of paris threw him an indignant glance and went by pons turned to schmucke do go and ask him what it is that they all have against me he said to the friend who knew all the details of the catastrophe that pons could tell him Monsieur schmucke began diplomatically mein friend bons is just recovering from an illness you have no doubt failed to recognize him not in the least but mit what can you reproach him you have a monster of ingratitude for a friend sir if he is still alive it is because nothing kills ill weeds people do well to mistrust artists they are as mischievous and spiteful as monkeys this friend of yours tried to dishonor his own family and to blight a young girl's character in revenge for a harmless joke i wish to have nothing to do with him i shall do my best to forget that i have known him or that such a man exists all the members of his family and my own share the wish sir so do all the persons who once did the said pons the honor of receiving him but monsieur you are a reasonable man if you will permit me i shall explain the affair you are quite at liberty to remain his friend sir if you are minded that way returned cardot but you need go no further for i must give you warning that in my opinion those who try to excuse or defend his conduct are just as much to blame to justify it yes for his conduct can neither be justified nor qualified and with that word the deputy for the seine went his way he would not hear another syllable i have two powers in the state against me smiled poor pons when schmucke had repeated these savage speeches everybody is against us schmucke answered dolorously 
let us go away before we shall meet other fools never before in the course of a truly ovine life had schmucke uttered such words as these never before had his almost divine meekness been ruffled he had smiled childlike on all the mischances that befell him but he could not look and see his sublime pons maltreated his pons his unknown aristides the genius resigned to his lot the nature that knew no bitterness the treasury of kindness the heart of gold alceste's indignation filled schmucke's soul he was moved to call pons's amphitryons fools for his pacific nature that impulse equalled the wrath of roland with wise foresight schmucke turned to go home by way of the boulevard du temple pons passively submitting like a fallen fighter heedless of blows but chance ordered that he should know that all his world was against him the house of peers the chamber of deputies strangers and the family the strong the weak and the innocent all combined to send down the avalanche in the boulevard poissonniere pons caught sight of that very monsieur cardot's daughter who young as she was had learned to be charitable to others through trouble of her own her husband knew a secret by which he kept her in bondage she was the only one among pons's hostesses whom he called by her christian name he addressed madame berthier as felicie and he thought that she understood him the gentle creature seemed to be distressed by the sight of cousin pons as he was called though he was in no way related to the family of the second wife of a cousin by marriage there was no help for it however felicie berthier stopped to speak to the invalid i did not think you were cruel cousin she said but if even a quarter of all that i hear of you is true you are very false oh do not justify yourself she added quickly seeing pons's significant gesture it is useless for two reasons in the first place i have no right to accuse or judge or condemn anybody for i myself know so well how much may be said for those who seem to be most guilty secondly your explanation would do no good monsieur berthier drew up the marriage contract for mademoiselle de marville and the vicomte Papineau. he is so exasperated that if he knew that i had so much as spoken one word to you one word for the last time he would scold me everybody is against you so it seems indeed madame pons said his voice shaking as he lifted his hat respectfully painfully he made his way back to the rue de normandie the old german knew from the heavy weight on his arm that his friend was struggling bravely against failing physical strength that third encounter was like the verdict of the lamb at the foot of the throne of god and the anger of the angel of the poor the symbol of the peoples is the last word of heaven they reached home without another word there are moments in our lives when the sense that our friend is near is all that we can bear our wounds smart under the consoling words that only reveal the depths of pain the old pianist you see possessed a genius for friendship the tact of those who having suffered much knew the customs of suffering pons was never to take a walk again from one illness he fell into another he was of a sanguine bilious temperament the bile passed into his blood and a violent liver attack was the result he had never known a day's illness in his life till a month ago he had never consulted a doctor so la cibot with almost motherly care and intentions at first of the very best called in the doctor of the quarter in every quarter of paris there is a doctor whose name and address are only known to the working classes to the little tradespeople and the porters and in consequence he is called the doctor of the quarter 
he undertakes confinement cases he lets blood he is in the medical profession pretty much what the general servant of the advertising column is in the scale of domestic service he must perforce be kind to the poor and tolerably expert by reason of much practice and he is generally popular dr poulain called in by madame cibot gave an inattentive ear to the old musician's complainings pons groaned out that his skin itched he had scratched himself all night long till he could scarcely feel the look of his eyes with the yellow circles about them corroborated the symptoms had you some violent shock a couple of days ago the doctor asked the patient yes alas you have the same complaint that this gentleman was threatened with said dr poulet looking at schmucke as he spoke it is an attack of jaundice but you will soon get over it he added as he wrote a prescription but in spite of that comfortable phrase the doctor's eyes had told another tale as he looked professionally at the patient and the death sentence though hidden under stereotyped compassion can always be read by those who wish to know the truth madame cibot gave a spy's glance at the doctor and read his thought his bedside manner did not deceive her she followed him out of the room do you think he will get over it asked madame cibot at the stairhead my dear madame cibot your lodger is a dead man not because of the bile in the system but because his vitality is low still with great care your patient may pull through somebody ought to take him away for a change how is he to go asked madame cibot he has nothing to live upon but his salary his friend has just a little money from some great ladies very charitable ladies in return for his services it seems they are two children i have looked after them for nine years i spend my life watching people die not of their disease but of another bad and incurable complaint the want of money said the doctor how often it happens that so far from taking a fee i am obliged to leave a five-franc piece on the mantel-shelf when i go poor dear monsieur poulain cried madame cibot ah if you hadn't only the hundred thousand livres a year what some stingy folks has in the quarter regular devils from hell they are you would be like providence on earth dr poulain had made the little practice by which he made a bare subsistence chiefly by winning the esteem of the porter's lodges in his district so he raised his eyes to heaven and thanked madame cibot with a solemn face worthy of tartuffe then you think that with careful nursing our dear patient will get better my dear monsieur poulain yes if this shock has not been too much for him poor man who can have vexed him there isn't nobody like him on earth except his friend monsieur schmucke i will find out what is the matter and i will undertake to give them that upset my gentleman a hauling over the coals look here my dear madame cibot said the doctor as they stood in the gateway one of the principal symptoms of his complaint is great irritability and as it is hardly to be supposed that he can afford a nurse the task of nursing him will fall to you so are you talking of monsieur ponche asked the marine store dealer he was sitting smoking on the curb post in the gateway and now he rose to join in the conversation yes daddy remonenc all right said remonenc ash to monish he is better off than monsieur monistrol and the big men in the curiosity line i know enough in the art line to tell you this the dear man has treasures he spoke with a broad auvergne dialect look here i thought you were laughing at me the other day when my gentlemen were out and i showed you the old rubbish upstairs said madame cibot in paris where walls have ears where doors have tongues and window bars have eyes there are few things more dangerous than the practice of standing to chat in a gateway partings are like postscripts to a letter indiscreet utterances that do as much mischief to the speaker as to those who overhear them a single instance will be sufficient as a parallel to an event in this history 
End of